Welcome everyone. Uh, we are here today with incredible graffiti artist Buff Monster. Um, Buff Monster is a New York City based uh, artist if you don't know him or his work. It's very colorful. There are lots of creatures. Uh, they're all very happy. There's a lot of ice cream as well and hidden meaning in all the work. Um, and I can't wait to ask all the questions and all the experiences that you had. You've been nom you've been featured in Banksy's uh, movie as well, Exit Through the Gift Shop. So um, you've done a lot, a lot of work. So really appreciate that we have an opportunity to talk. Where are you based right now? Oh, I'm in New York. I'm here in my studio, which is on... Uh which is in the Lower East Side. So, uh, you know, it's Lower Manhattan. Everything's small, everything's loud. Nice. Know, so. I can see a little colorful work behind you as well. That's really, really oh. nice. My first question to you, um, <laughs> let's start from the very beginning uh, where you decided to study fine art. Um, and as far as I know, um, you had a mining business administration as well, which is very interesting. Um, choice for someone who wants to be an artist. So did you always know that you will be a graffiti artist or an artist of some sort and kind of from your degree to your career you always went towards that direction or you kind of changed what you want to do throughout life? Um, well, firstly, I, 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 uh, I, I wouldn't call myself a graffiti artist. So okay. For other guys that do graffiti, that's that's not me. I painted graffiti for two years in high school and then haven't done it since. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, I made art as a kid. Mm -hmm. And um, then, uh, so I grew up in Hawaii. I was making art as a kid. And, um, and then I stopped making art. I was... I was a young kid in Hawaii, running around, catching fish, riding bikes, doing all the stuff kids in Hawaii do. And uh, I got reintroduced to making art via graffiti through someone I didn't even know. And um, that was the first time that art could be exciting. Because usually making art means you're by yourself, you're in a studio, you're at home, you're wherever you are, and it's safe. Um, but doing graffiti was the first time that art was an adventure. It was a team sport. You didn't know what was going to happen. Was it allowed where you lived? It was obviously against the law. Oh, yeah. No, totally illegal. Yeah. Okay, fun. Did you have to go like at night or early morning? I remember when I tried to do graffiti in my early years, we had to go really, really early in the morning and then quickly run. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, so this was back in uh, 95. I think. Okay. A long time ago. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I, graffiti was a passion, and then uh, that, that uh, it just faded away, you know. But, but what remained uh, was the power and the fun of doing stuff in the streets. So I lived in L.A. I put up lots of posters. So yeah, I've heard there was like... According to Wikipedia, at least, there was this big thing when you printed out thousand posters and put yeah. them all over LA. How did this idea come about? Why did you think it would be a right thing to do? Well, I was inspired by what Shepard Ferry was doing with the Obey Giant campaign. Mm -hmm. There was uh, actually a guy that uh, predates Shepard named Robbie Connell, who was putting up posters in LA since forever ago. And he inspired Shepard and all that sort of stuff. So he was teaching at the school that I was going to. And okay. so, uh, and the thing about posters is that LA is a driving city. And so that means putting up posters actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, you want to put little things all over the place uh, as opposed to, let's say, a few big things. Um, so like New York is a walking city. So painting a big mural somewhere makes sense because people are going to walk by it. Painting a mural in L.A. is a different thing. If someone drives by it, they see it. If they're not going to drive by it, they're never going to see it. I see. So you were very strategic about this move of putting these posters out in L.A. so people can see it. What did you want to achieve with it? Were you looking for commercial work? Did you try to make a name for yourself? What did you think was the end goal? Well, that's the thing. I think, um, you know, street art has really 
morphed into this weird self-promotion thing. You know, there's people eager to take photos and pay to take tours walking around cities. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. It's really different than it was 20 years ago. I mean, really putting up posters for me was a way to take some ownership over uh, the city that I lived in. You know, a way to craft it and make it look a way I thought it should look. You know, it was it wasn't like, oh, well, let me do this so, oh, people know who I am. And it wasn't anything like that. It was just this is fun. I think the city would look better if these posters were around. You okay, know. and what were what was the outcome of this? What happened after you put them out? First of all, did it? something happened straight away or you had to wait for something to happen what happened after well people started to notice okay. That's what, you know um you know i think anytime you put up something i think that's really the strength of shepherds obey giant campaign is that when you know when you put something up people aren't exactly sure what it is but if you see it a lot of times well that becomes something you know so yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I started getting invited to art shows and all sorts of stuff. And, yeah, there was some client work that came in. But, but that wasn't the goal. And, and to me, that seemed like a very weird side effect to you. Because, you know, the posters in the street and the paintings I was making at the time were kind of related. But I don't know. It, it, it was unexpected. Okay. But when you moved to LA, I think it's so exciting that you kind of made this big move and you had this plan that you put out these posters and something might happen. What did you want to do? What did you see as a career? Because being an artist probably is one of the most difficult paths you can take. There is no really um, a money side of things. is very, very vague. And what was your plan? Well, so I went to university, as you call it, we call it college, mm -hmm. but uh, I went to school for art and business. Mm -hmm. And so the plan was that having a good business sense was going to be really important no matter what I did. But mm -hmm. switching from business to art, that's when it's like, okay, art and business, that makes sense. So what I did was I got a job, I got an internship at a, a big magazine company. Mm -hmm. And I turned and I was one of the first interns they had. I worked for the art director of a magazine called Hot Rod Magazine. It was about hot rods. So I did that as an intern. Then I got a job when I graduated. And so I, all of a sudden, I had this regular job working in a cubicle, a car, a car payment, rent. I had all this stuff. You know, it's like you graduate college, you just get all the stuff. Um, it was rewarding for what it was, but I was also going out at night putting up posters and all, all the fun stuff. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, I mean, I think some people are like, oh, it's so smart. You went to school for business. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think it's smart. I think it's like super obvious. <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, what I always tell people is that everything around us is business. I mean, every single thing, the shoes you're wearing, the lipstick you're wearing, that banner behind you, <laughs> phone that you're using. I mean, anything that you're using is from a business. Like literally every single thing comes from a business. And so business is around us in ways that you probably don't even consider. Um, but I think, I think if you look at artists, I think if you look at the most successful artists, they're also the best businessmen. You know, Andy Warhol has a quote about art is business, best art is the best business. But I think, I think it's really important to understand business. You know, so, yeah, that's how it goes. You know, you got to have both. You got to have some amount of talent and you got to have some amount of understanding of business. You know, if you only one or the other, well, that's not going to work out very well. So when did you realize that your cubicle job, so you're working every day, you're making enough money to leave and you can do your night thing when you put art on the streets and you really enjoy doing that night part. So when did you realize enough of this, internship or job or whatever i'm doing i want to be a full-time artist and i'm gonna make it right so i never knew how that was gonna happen how do i go from having this job with this paycheck blah 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 how do i go from that 
to just finding my own way and paying for everything that's got to be paid for. So what happened was I, I got introduced to a guy who wanted to make t-shirts for me. And I said, cool, I want to go on tour. And he said, I can put you on tour. <laughs> did what? got Rockstar Video Games to give us a bunch of money. And we went on tour. So I quit my job. Well, I actually, I told them I was going to go on tour. <laughs> um, and then I said, should I come back? And they said, no. I said, okay. <laughs> so, um, so Rockstar Video Games give us the money. I was the headlining artist. Two supporting artists. We had a tour driver, a tour photographer, and a tour manager. Now, this is in 2006. We didn't have media of any sort, not even Twitter. And we, we booked this tour. We did 23 cities in five and a half. And we drive around the country. We're doing live painting, live sales screening, video game tournament, all that sort of stuff. And we're updating a website every day. Again, we had no social media. We had to promote this the old school way. We're uploading photos every night to the website so people can see what we're doing. And that was it. I came back to LA. I was busy as all hell. I had requests for shows and interviews and a million things. And um, I was basically too busy for a job. But the one thing that, that, that saw me through in that transition period was that my friend hired me to do a magazine and it was, it was for a corporate client, which means I had good money and it was only quarterly. So I got this nice paycheck and I didn't have to do too much work and I could just do art and do everything. And so that's been uh, 12 years. Oh, brilliant. So you found a job that you have passion for and you could still do your other even more creative projects outside of, of your job. So you can combine two and still live the life that you want. And how that kind of your tour. So I think it's so exciting, first of all, that you decided to like go on a tour and see the world as well as do what you like and meet lots of people. This is really, really smart and really brave as well. Um, especially before social media, I can imagine it was really difficult to get people to promote your art. So did it go? As you expected, was it difficult at the beginning and became a bit easier towards the end? What was the, the journey? God, I still remember going to the tour manager's house the first day. It's like, you had these giant bags. Because we started, I was living in LA at the time, and we started in Miami. And so we had to ship everything we needed to Miami. Oh my God, it was insane. Um, you know, the thing about tour, what can I say? Um, you know, it had its nice points. It had its uh, frustrating points. Um, yeah, some of the events were busier than others. You know, that's for sure. Um, I think, uh, you know, sometimes I toy with the idea of doing it again. You know, I mean, that was 12 years ago. It's a totally different world now. I mean, I mean, you know, booking things, social media support. I mean, you can't even imagine. I mean, it's so old school. It's like, wh what were we doing? <laughs> I, I think it shows that, you know, if, if you got an idea and if you can pitch it to a client, uh, you know, it just might work out, you know? And I'm glad it did because that was, that was the change I needed at that time, you know? Yeah. So what happened after you came back? You got this deal with the magazine, uh, your friend offered you to do some work. Was it there then you realized, okay, I can actually make a living out of doing art? Or was it still kind of unclear where you're going with all this? Did you have any doubts at that point that you're doing the right thing? Uh, no, no doubts, no nothing. Uh, I was... So much of my life in those following years was stressful as all hell. It was, <laughs> you know, I think that, God, I mean, you know, so many opportunities present themselves all the time. And, you know, the trick is to determine, well, which ones are you going to do? And at that time, even though I said no to almost everything that came in, I said yes to enough things that I was just so busy and so stressed out. And I mean, for years and, and mostly broke also. I mean, I was making a name for myself. I was working on big projects. I was having big art shows. 
But, God, I mean, looking back on those days, God, I don't miss them. I'm glad I went through them, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a worthwhile, it's character building. Definitely character building to have those. So um, what made you go and not give up? What was that thought in your head that gave you energy to keep going? Well, I, I, I never thought about giving up. It's just like, you know, this is, uh, this is the choice. This is the deal. This is what you do. You know, you're young. You bust your ass. You pay your dues. You do what you can. You try to mind your business as best you can. You try to work with partners and clients. Um, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I grew up in a small business, you know, small family business. That's what we had growing up. And, you know, you just, uh, yeah, failure is not an option. Just, just, just do it. So you're always positive. I suppose positivity is something that you can see through your work as well. You always have an optimistic view of life. So I suppose that during that time, you, you still knew you will make something out of it, even when it was hard. Did you feel like that moment happened? Was there, like, a certain point where you're like, okay, now is my big breakthrough. Yeah, you know, I think, I think, you, you know, uh, maybe even today, maybe, maybe this idea of like how this next project could be. <laughs> I think back in those days, I thought, I guess I thought that more often. I guess I thought, God, this one could really do it. And it never happened. And then the next one, oh, this could be the one and then it wasn't um i think ultimately what happened is i just got tired of la all the bullshit and i was over it and so i moved to new york that was in 2012 that was six years ago six years ago yeah so i've been here for six years and the thing about new york uh is that it is amazing and it affords <laughs> opportunities that i had no idea about it has changed uh, my life. It's changed my career. Changed everything. Uh, how how did it change? What changed? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that I didn't change. It's still me. Still doing what I do. And that was the most surprising bit. It wasn't. Uh, it was just me. It's like once I lived in New York, all these new things happened. You know, uh, clients. What I didn't realize was that clients. Want to hire a New York based artist? <laughs> well, that when I lived in LA, no one told me that. <laughs> um, no, gallery want to work with a New York based artist. Cool, great. So I it's almost like a brand being a New York based artist. You know, basically, as soon as I moved to New York, like literally, like within weeks, I was flying to Tokyo, flying to Paris, flying to wherever. Like, it's just like, as soon as I'm here, people are like, hey, do you want to do this thing? Hey, do you want to do this thing? What about this thing? I was like, sure, let's Did do you it. do anything? So when you moved to LA, you had this strategic move of putting the posters out to build your name. Did you do anything similar or did you have any plans for moving to New York? No, I had no plans of moving to New York and I didn't even know I wasn't necessarily planning on moving to New York either. I just, I was tired of LA. I just needed something else. And so I came to New York for an art show, a small art show at my friend's gallery. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just move to New York. And so I came back a few weeks later, hung out for a couple of weeks. I said, this is cool. And then I just <laughs> went back to LA and I was like, all right, I need to find a place to live. So flew back out to New York, found an apartment, signed a lease. Went back to LA, had a month to pack up all my stuff, loaded up a truck and drove out here. So. And what was, was the it. first thing you did when you moved to New York? Did you meet with all the people that you knew? Did you email everyone that you thought might be interested? What was the first thing on your agenda? Uh, basically, like literally the night that I arrived in New York, like literally within two hours of arriving into New York, uh, I called an artist named Lamore Supreme. You can look him up on Instagram, Lamore Supreme. And I went to meet up with him at a bar. And, you know, he just moved into a studio like that week across from another friend, Suck Lord. You can look him up on Instagram too. So, yeah, these guys, I just started hanging out. And Lamore and I started traveling the world together, painting stuff together, doing all sorts of stuff together. 
Uh, and how do you feel? That's very, I think it's so exciting that the first thing that you did is like found people who do the same thing or similar thing to you who are passionate about the same things and started hanging out with them. And you saw, I suppose, some progress or something out of it. While if I compare it to, let's say, design world, especially in some communities, there is such a competition that you almost see everyone who's doing the same type of work as a potential competitor. So you won't tell them all the secrets or you try to kind of avoid going to places there will be too many designers. Is art community the same or is it more collaborative and you kind of always try to stay together? You know, I think that You know, I think that it's, it is a little different. Uh, yes, there's competition, you know, there, uh, you know, can be rivalries and blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. You know, there's only a certain number of galleries, let's say. Or, <laughs> or, let's say. Um, but on the other hand, I think, I think art really di is different from design in the way that, you know, if you like someone's paintings, well, then buy one. And that doesn't mean you can't buy this guy's painting either, you know? But if you're a designer, it's like, well, one guy's going to get this job. <laughs> this guy, so. Okay. Yeah. So, right? And, that makes sense. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And I think you collaborate as well with a lot of artists throughout your career. You had um, a show with Dalek and you had kind of a collaborative experience. So how is it to collaborate with someone who does similar type of work to yours, but has a completely different style? Um, did you find it challenging? Did you learn something new? You know, uh, doing the show with Dalek, that was uh, in March of this year. Uh, you know, I've been a fan of Dalek's work forever. I mean, you know, when I was like a snot-nosed kid doing whatever in college, I was probably went to Dalek's first show in LA. I mean, I, you know, I've been a fan of his forever. And so, you know, but what was funny is that I think he and I have both, even though he's a couple years older than me, he's had different opportunities than I have had. I think that we both kind of arrived at this place where we do these characters, we're known for these characters, we like these characters, but we want to explore some other things. And so, you know, uh, if you've seen uh, Dalek's work recently, it's a, well, actually in the last, let's say, five or ten years, there's a lot of geometric stuff, you know, and it was only recently he started painting characters again. So, um, yeah, it was, you know, I mean, I hoped we had, uh, we would have had an opportunity to work on some painting together. Uh, we didn't have that opportunity because we didn't have a lot of time to get the show together. Um, but, you know, uh, we did paint together in the gallery. And that was a lot of fun. And I think <laughs> there's other opportunities or, for Dalek and I to work together in the future. So, Did it remind you of your early graffiti days when you were going out as a crew and doing art together? Uh, not really, you know, because <laughs> illegally, like you're very aware of that. <laughs> and you're doing what you can not to get arrested, not to draw <laughs> to yourself. You know, we're just, I don't have the energy to do that. I mean, come on, I just, just want to show up. <laughs> you know. Cool, makes sense. Dude, and, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> and let's talk about your incredible style because you are very well known for particular color palette, for particular style, for particular type of creatures that you uh, paint. How did you develop that style? When it like kind of clicked that this is what you want to do for the rest of your life? Was it during your university days or is it later? Well, let's see. Part of me giving up graffiti uh, all those years ago was to be aware and I guess responsible of the work and how the work exists in the world. I think you have to think about that. You have to think about the viewer, especially if you're doing stuff in the public. You really, like, if you're painting murals, for example. You know, there's a lot of mural festivals around the world these days. 
And I think, okay, that's great. You go somewhere, you paint a wall, and you leave. But you know what? The community there has to live with that wall. <laughs> and so you do have to be aware and responsible for what you're putting in the world. Now, that's not, a, a, it's not an issue of self-censorship or anything like that. It's just being responsible about making a contribution. Like, I want to make a contribution. That's an important thing. That might not be important to other people, but I like to make a contribution, a positive contribution. So, um, but to go back to your question, um, yeah, so I was, I was making these paintings with these characters uh, from about 2001 until about 2012. So that was like 11 solid years working with these characters. In 2012, the character evolved into this like humanoid ice cream character, and that was that was kind of what was needed at the time. Uh, I was interested in making paintings based on the Renaissance. You know, the Renaissance, obviously, um, there's a lot of figurative work. I mean, most of the Renaissance paintings are people in some sort of situation, and so the character I was doing at the time was short legs and short arms. I, I couldn't use that character in the type of way that I needed. And so the character basically evolved uh, with longer arms and legs and um, more of a personality. And, and that was in 2012. And um, yeah, I've been working with the same characters ever since, you know. You know and the, I, I quite like that there is a lot of meaning in your work as well. So you wrote this melting yeah. manifesto and kind of the the whole of idea behind the ice cream and the, the thinking. Can you tell a bit more about that? What is it something that you always had from the beginning in your work or it kind of was post -re rationalization of what you were doing? I think that it's important to act intentionally. And I think that, I think, you know, I don't know. I think the manifesto, I like the manifesto. I think people should read the manifesto. It came out two years ago. It explains why ice cream, explains the whole metaphor of ice cream. It has a studio guidelines. It explains a lot of stuff. It's kind of like a little kind of secret book. Like, here it is. <laughs> Want all, you want to know everything? <laughs> um, and the, the book uh, is intentionally black and white because I wanted to um, wanted to kind of, I guess, limit who was going to get it in a way. It's like, hey, look, if you want all the pretty pictures, that's cool. Buy that book. But if you want to get to the kind of the nitty gritty, this is the book for you. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, to your point, I think that there is a lot of thought that goes into the characters and what I do. And I think that there's a lot of people around the world that do cute characters and that's great. I guess maybe I'm one of them, but I think, I think if you're going to have any lasting contribution, there's got to be something behind those characters. You know, it can't just be like, Oh, here's my thing. You're like, okay. Do you think people get the meaning behind? Because it's really deep meaning that you're trying to put there. And I really enjoy kind of reading about that and understanding that the ice cream is not really the ice cream and there is the thinking. Do you think all people understand it or it's only you have to read the manifesto to actually get what you're trying to, to say? I think that it's probably lost in most people. Uh, but that's okay. I think, I think, you know, I think, uh, I think it's important to have stuff that can immediately resonate with people. And then I think it's also important to have the same stuff that could resonate with people in a different way. And I think that's the, the power, the lasting power of some of the, like, like the Simpsons, for example. You can look at The Simpsons and say, oh, okay, that's funny, that's for kids, whatever. But if you actually watch it, the reason it's been on the air for, what, 30-something years? Yeah. That there's a lot more going on there than, than what, what appears to be. And so I think creating two layers of, of meaning is, uh, is a good way to go. Now, if people don't read the manifesto, if people don't think about the ice cream metaphor the way that I have 
uh, structured it. That's okay. But I, 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 I think you should take solace in knowing that there is a deeper level. And if you want to find out what that deeper <laughs> level, that's on you. And if you don't, that's fine too. It doesn't matter. Just enjoy it. it you know, I mean, art's for the eyes. So just, just enjoy it. Brilliant. I love that. Uh, we have lots of questions from the audience. Um, I don't know if you can see their comments that lots of people say by. I have no idea. So. great things about your work. There are so many of your fans who joined and I love your work as well. So it's good to see there is such a big community that just um, fans and um, say lots of great things. Um, so let's find some good questions to discuss. Um, so, oh, people are saying lots of great things. It's just very nice to see that. Very positive. So, with your positive art, you attract really positive people. That's all I can say. Um, yeah. Who is your biggest inspiration? Well, I'll tell you who is amazing. I'll tell you, man. I mean, there's a lot of artists, big artists, famous artists that, that inspire me. But I'll tell you who is amazing is Walt Disney. I've read two books on Walt Disney. And I wouldn't have read these books on Walt Disney. Uh, but a collector out of the blue mailed me three books on Walt Disney. Just oh, wow. And I read one and I was blown away. And uh, a certain time later, I read another one. And I was equally blown away. What was away. the book? So we can uh, recommend it to people. Man. And the second one I read is called How to Be Like Walt. Um, and God, you know, geez. I mean, Walt Disney, I mean, Snow White came out 80 years ago. I mean, it's, it's insane. I mean, it changed movie history 80 years ago. Um, but what the big takeaway from the book was that how much Walt struggled as famous as he was, as much money as he had, as many employees as he had, he struggled almost his entire life. It's amazing. Do you feel like you are going through the similar challenges that he did that made you so connected to him as a person? Uh, well, he had a lot different challenges than I did. <laughs> uh, but I can take solace and knowing that, uh, you know, everyone has to struggle at, at some time, you know, and, and for a long time sometimes. You know? and Talking about the inspiring people and people who, uh, who are amazing at what they do, have you met Banksy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You did? Great. Yeah. I've met him a lot. <laughs> Tell us, who is he? Everyone is asking. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, is he a good person? What's that? Is he a good person? Uh, he seems to be, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I think he seems to be, you know, for sure. Um, yeah, it's been when, a long time. When did you meet him? What was the occasion? Uh, I went to, like, his first show in L.A., and he wasn't Banksy. It wasn't this guy. He was just a guy. He was Banksy. Oh, okay, he has a show. Okay. I'll go. Fine. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I heard, heard these stories about, you know, he doesn't go to his own openings or he does or whatever, you know, there's all this like stuff, even then it was like all this stuff. You're like, okay, okay. So I went, I met him, you know, we had a nice talk and, um, you know, what can I say? <laughs> You know, I don't know. He's around. I know people that have made stuff for him, you know, I, you know, whatever. I mean, he's around. If, if, if you are involved with graffiti in Bristol and you're more than 40 years old, you probably met him or you know somebody that knows him or, I mean, you know, he is around. Okay, great. Um, some more questions from people who are watching okay. us. Any advice for new artists? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, um, there's no shortcuts, you know, that's for sure at all. It's just hard work, you know, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, there's that old saying about, um, what is it? I forget the exact word, but, um, like expertise or something takes 10,000 hours. 
you know, it's just, it's just, it's just a lot of work. You just have to put in the work. I think, I think anytime I hear a question like that, what I hear is what's the shortcut? <laughs> no shortcut. You just have to do the work. You know, that's it. You know, I, I love watching comedy. I love watching these interviews with Jerry Seinfeld. He's amazing. Um, you know, but he's like, he's like, he wants to understand why is something funny? You know, it's not like, oh, you did a good show. Da, da, da. It's like, no, 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 let's break this down. Why is this funny? And the thing about stand-up comedy, I don't aspire to do it, but I do go and watch it. The thing about stand-up comedy is it's either funny or it isn't, but you have to put in that time, you know? And what Jerry Seinfeld will tell you is, yeah, I might tell you 25 funny things, but what I'm not telling you is the 500 unfunny things that I already told on stage. You know, it's like this process. You just have to, you have to trust the process. You have to put the time in. You have to do it. And that's it. And how do you make sure your progress that, because especially with art, it, there is no, like, a salary progression or a very... So how do you know you're actually progressing as an artist or you're just stuck? Well... I, well, I mean, I think you're going to have to make that own determination. Um, but, you know, in this day and age of social media, I think you could, you know, you can put something out there, you can get some immediate response to it. But I think that you also kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. If you're like, oh, this painting got twice as many likes and comments as this one, oh, I should just do more like that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, more question about your current life. Uh, what's one challenge that you face as a professional artist now? God, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> well, you know, one thing that's always tricky is that, um, Right now, I don't have an assistant. And so I am actually interviewing some assistants tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, you know, there, there's a lot to do. And I think, you know, I think, you know, people say, oh, there's not enough time in the day. And it's not exactly accurate. You know, for me, the struggle is always to have the people that I can rely on, that I can delegate the work to. That, that's always a tricky thing. Now, I have a team. I have a good team uh, around me. I, I have agents. I have all sorts of people that help me. Um, so that's good. I'm really happy that that part of the business is taken care of. But as they're out there pitching me for things and negotiating deals and all that sort of stuff, I need to be able to take on that work. And sometimes deadlines overlap and big projects overlap, and I need to be able to deliver on time. Uh, I've never been late. Uh, being light is not an option, um, so it's important that I have a team in the studio that can help me deliver everything I need to deliver. Makes sense. I like your very structured approach to what you do. Do you actually have advice to artists who don't understand the power of business or were never exposed to the business side of things? What can they do tomorrow to make themselves more successful as artists from the business point of view? Well, um, I think you can read some books. I mean, I read a lot of books. Um, that's one of the nice benefits of living in New York and riding the subway is that <laughs> it's like every day um, for like 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And God, I've read so many books. I read mostly business books, like, uh, like marketing books, uh, art books, art history books. Um, God, there, I'm reading a book right now called Creativity Inc. It's about, uh, written by the, uh, man Pixar. Uh, what? Pixar. Yeah, Pixar, exactly. So I'd wanted to read this book for a long time. Uh, it's not my favorite book. I'm getting through it. I like some things in it. Not my favorite book. Oh, no, I really liked it. I thought it's really well written and I actually would recommend people who are in a creative field to read it, but... I don't know now if I should recommend it. I think, I think there's things in it that I think are, are worth reading and exploring and learning. I agree. And not my favorite book, though. 
Um, but I what is your favorite book? Oh, God. Um, well, okay, okay. It's called Positioning. Positioning, um, okay. Not in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing. It's about marketing. Mm -hmm. And it talks about brands, like real world brands. Like, here's Coke fighting Pepsi. Here's. Man, that is such an amazing book seriously positioning positioning you know you're like oh yeah positioning yeah, i've heard that word i have an idea what that word is uh-uh uh-uh you don't know what positioning is positioning oh it's so important uh, uh, on that note we have a question how did you identify the market for your work and do you have any tips for illustrators looking to do the same Uh, that is a good question. I'm going to move over here so I can plug my phone in. Hold on a second. Um, well, that, okay, well, you should definitely read positioning. Uh, that is, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, because what that book points out is you need to be able to present yourself in a certain way. And the more, the clearer you can be about that, better off you'll be so if you're an illustrator well what kind of illustrator are you do you do cute stuff do you do um i don't know medical illustrations i mean what is the thing you kind of have to plant your flag and say this is what i do the jack of all trades and eh, it's not really a thing i read a whole book about that too it's called focus about how if you're a business like these multinational companies that do Everything from air conditioners to shoes to trucks to like the, anything seems like a good idea, not a good idea. Um, so you kind of got to plant your plant your flag and say, "This is what I do." Now, you could say, "Well, I don't follow my own advice," and I'd say that you're right because <laughs> I have a lot of, and it, it is one thing that I struggle with because on one hand, I'm I'm a street artist. I paint murals. I do all that. On another hand, I, I make uh, paintings. I show in galleries. On the other hand, I make lots of merchandise, lots of collectibles. I love doing that. On the other hand, I do lots of client work. So I think I would benefit from doing less things, but <laughs> haven't been able to quite figure out what I would cut out. If I was going to cut one of those things out, what would I cut out? I don't really want to cut anything out. So I got things in the works. I've been having some meetings. Hopefully there'll be something uh, soon. Brilliant. Um, last couple of questions. Lots of people join us from different countries and everyone is asking, when are you next in Spain? When are you going to Russia? When, what are the next countries that you're going to and when are you going to be in all those countries? Um, geez. Uh, I, I have no idea, actually. I was just in Spain for like 10 days. I was just in Amsterdam for a week. Um, where else am I going? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Someone wants me to come to China. I've never been there before. Let's see if that works out. Um, I don't know. I mean, anyone that follows me or joins the mail list on buzzmonster.com, I mean, you can do all that stuff. You'll, you'll have plenty of warning. Um, I'm actually probably going to have an event here in New York if anyone's coming to New York. I mean, the nice thing about living in New York, everyone comes to New York. That's brilliant. So definitely, guys, follow Buff Monster. And if you're not following him yet on all the social networks and then when the next event or show or anything is out i'm sure you all will be notified and then you can probably even see this great artist in person last last very last question for anyone who is at this kind of middle stage of um exploring themselves as an artist trying to figure out their own style kind of not sure even where to go, like going into sculpture, going into like art, so feeling very creative, but not seeing the path. What would you recommend doing? I think you just gotta keep going. You just gotta keep making stuff. You just, that, that's kind of the number one thing. Andy Warhol has a quote about that. You know, he said that, you know, you make stuff and while people are deciding whether it's good or not, just make more stuff. And so I think if you're committed to being a creative person, then if you're inspired and you can and you, you know and you you're compelled to make work 
then you can you just got to keep making work, you know, because eventually you'll figure out like, oh, I don't want to do this or hey, I want to do this or this is too much work or hey, this is nice. This is easy and people like it or, you know, I don't know, whatever it is or hey, people like it, but eh, I don't like it. So, you know what? I don't, I don't care about that. I'm going to go do this. So I think that, you know, you just you just got to figure it out. I mean, I think I always look at it as like one of those choose your own adventure puzzles. You know, it's like all these lines, you can fill in the little blanks, you know, like, you know, it's like all the verb or no, I'm sorry, not a verb, like a noun, like something, a noun did this and da, 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 you know, like all sorts of stuff. Um, so I look at an art career kind of that way where no single choice really makes a difference. But over the course of five, 10, 20, 50 years, those little choices add up. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that it's accumulation of all these little choices, projects you will do, projects you won't do. You know, that, that's how it goes. This is such a fantastic note to, to finish our conversation. And I think it's really good advice for everyone not necessarily even artists, for anyone who's doing anything, just do more, experiment, and at the end, we'll all make sense. Um, thank you so, so much, Buff. It was such a pleasure talking to you, and I got definitely really inspired. Guys who watched our interview, uh, make sure you check out Buff's page uh, and go and buy Melting Manifesto, really great read, and other colorful books with more inspiration. Uh, thanks a lot uh, yep. and follow yep. Futureland Academy for more interviews.